Let's start with Corteria. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the report out. So uh, Karina, Adam, and I talked about uh, the place software should have in the scholarly record. And we all agreed it should be in the scholarly record, <laughs> which I think surprises no one. Um, we uh, agreed that um, software should be on par with other research materials like data, articles, whatever. We discussed what the scholarly record is uh, and how it manifests. Um, so there's like a part of the scholarly record that's the conversation part, like how are we citing software? How are we giving recognition? Um, things like that. And then there's also, I brought in the piece of a long-term scholarly record. So there's a scholarly record that is like being preserved by libraries and archives. And there's a lens through which to view software's place in an archive as part of its place in the scholarly record. So uh, we talked about different um, purposes uh, for being in the scholarly record. And we talked about how those manifest. Um, and we also discussed some of the in-depth issues where software can't be made openly available for whatever reason. Is it part of the scholarly record then? If not, how can we um, you know, provide access to relevant materials in a way that could enable it as being part of the scholarly record? Um, so these are things where for whatever reason you need a proprietary license on some code or no one can see it. Uh, is it still part of the scholarly record? If so, uh, under what conditions or what needs to be there alongside it? Um, so I think that's a good overview. Adam, I don't know if you have anything to add, but that's sort of the high level what we talked about. I think that's a, a pretty good summary, yeah. Thank you. So any comments or questions for the team? Conditions? Okay, um, we can go over to Boston now. I've been wanting to say that all day. Uh, we can go over to Boston now and uh, ask them how about their report back. Uh, right, so Team Boston, uh, we were talking about how do you engage community members without leading to burnout. Uh, so, one of the things that we, we identified as a, a key feature to avoid burnout is to create environments in which we can foster a community uh, that has the support without having any unrealistic uh, key performance indicators. So metrics that are unrealistic, you should must produce 20 papers per year, are not a, a good way of uh, preventing uh, burnout. Also, these type of unrealistic uh, key performance indicators, if you put the, put the focus maybe too much on, um, or the current key performance indicators, put more, uh, more focus on publishing papers than on software. Um, and that creates, a, a, yeah, a shifts the focus uh, away from software and uh, can lead people who focus the, their time on software leading to yeah lead to burnout because they, they're not focusing in the right things um so we should create communities that uh, allow uh, their community leads uh, to identify early signs of burnout uh, so professors or managers should be able to identify this we should create a, an environment in which this is possible for them uh, without adding a too many uh, extra layers of management. Uh, but we should also create communities that allow members to step back uh, when they need to. If there's the, the pressure on them becomes too high, if there's things that they don't feel that they can accomplish, they should have a people should have a space to say, I'm sorry, I need to take a step back, and this should be possible. Uh, how to create these communities that uh, allow for uh, both for the management to identify the early signs and for uh, developers to take the, take a step back with ne when necessary. This is something that is still, we, we don't know how to create these communities. We don't know what's the, the answer. So that's an current unanswered question. Um, 
And another thing is that we should, in order to avoid fragmentation of communities, when there's too much frustration uh, inside of a community, that, that it will lead to it uh, splitting up uh, or parting different ways, then there should be good communication mechanisms that prevent this from happening in the long, long term. Um, I don't know if anybody else from Boston, if I missed something. An excellent summary. So uh, did you stray into, uh, did you stray into kind of general burnout in the sector given pandemic and those sorts of things or was it really much focused on the, um, you know, getting people's time in a community context? Well, uh, we did discuss a little bit about the uh, online versus offline. So how does it, does the, the pandemic context or does the uh, spending more time in front of a, on online events or offline events, so does, how does that affect people's ability to focus their time? And uh, one thing that we, we couldn't quite place is why online events feel like you're more under pressure even though it reduces some of the pressure on traveling um so that's also an, a current unanswered question but i'm sure you can completely relate to that <laughs> running an event online Troy. Yeah, it has its challenges yeah, right. yeah um any other questions for team boston Okay, uh, Hilary, would you be able to give a brief summary of what we discussed in Genoa, or I'm comfortable doing that, or, or yeah. Yeah, sure. So in our room, it's about, let me see, what is the current state of career paths for research software engineering data stewards and digital humanities roles? What needs to be done to move this forward? And our um, the participants include me, Peter, and Shoei. We talked about kind of practical things in the job markets, and we walked through a a position role that's currently available on Digital Curation Center at the UK. And other than that, we are also recognizing that the maturity of research software engineering and sustainability is kind of different in different areas of the world. For example, at the, in the UK and Europe, there there may be more opportunities comparing to the US or other countries around the world. Um, and these are reflected on the job markets available positions. But it is also notable that um, when there are positions available, they are often project based instead of situated in an established department or position in the institutions. Um, we also touch upon a little bit about the background of people working in this field and noted that um, many people may be from computer science background um, to be a research software engineer. And because I'm from library and information science background, I was kind of curious to see if there are um, like people from my positions working in this field. And Peter did mention there are some, but the skill sets would be um, slightly different than what was being taught in school. Um, an example is the classification system that is often emphasized in our former education, but oftentimes it is not enough to be used in research software engineering or just um, in general repository site. And Peter and Shoi, please um, supplement any details if you would like. No, I think that was a good summary. Um... Yeah, we were just really looking at it from a very concrete perspective in terms of 
you know, there's a lot of discussion happening about career career paths, but what actually available? And it's quite interesting that there's these are two different things. Yeah, I think also you you, you summarized it very well, and uh, I have not much to add. And we we indeed it was a rather practical kind of discussion. It was uh, as it 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 was also I think for her uh, personal interest what possibilities there are. So 